I have uh, uploaded the solution to the quiz and I have uploaded the solution to assignment 2. Both of them are available on Carmen. And uh, today we will continue our discussion about optimization over convex set. And in particular, we want to solve the following problem. Manifold sub optimization method. I want to solve minimize fx such that ax is less than or equal to b. Okay, and so this constraint set would look something like a solid object, okay, something like this, and we want to do minimization of a function over this kind of a convex set. And last time we discussed that in the case of manifold suboptimization method, we start from some initial point, we get to the one of these edges, and then we slide along these edges. So we slide along these edges and then we reach a vertex and then we need to decide whether we want to slide along this edge or whether we want to slide along this edge. So let's say we chose to slide along this edge and we continue moving forward until we reach a point where we have to go inside the set in order to get to the optimal point X star. Okay, so that's the overall idea of manifold suboptimization method. So what there are there are two sort of non-standard moves in this case, right? So then, is there are there sort of two rules? One that governs moving along an edge, and the one that governs that yes. transition away from yes, it? Okay. yes. So the first thing, so that's a good point. So the first thing is when you get to an edge, you need to decide whether you want to move in this direction or whether you want to move in this direction, right? So that's the first. Uh, decision that you need to make. So what do you think, which direction should we move in? Closer, to the Cl closer, right? So this is, if this is the direction you want to move in, then you want gradient of fx k, so this is your xk, transpose dk should be less than zero, right? So you want to descend you want to get go into a direction so that the value of the function reduces. And then when you get here, then again you have two choices. You can go in this direction or you can go in this direction. And then again you need to make a choice. Uh, and you will pick a direction in which the gradient of the function uh, is such that if you descend along that direction, then your fun value of the function decreases. Yeah. So with uh, his question about how uh, there being two parts to this when you're moving towards one of the edges of a set and when you're moving away. Uh -huh. How do you know when you're supposed to move uh, away into the optimal point? Because you can assume um, when you're starting out that, that you're right. either not on one of those edges or you'll just spend one step to guarantee you're on one of those edges. Right. How do you quantify I need to move away now? So you will, so once you, once we will go through the details of the algorithm, uh, at one point of time you will see that it is in your best interest to move in that direction. So when we get to it, we will discuss that. Okay, essentially the set of active constraints will become zero, like empty set, and then you will basically be moving inside the set, and you will go around the set in order to get to the optimal point. <clears throat> so one of the things that we need to understand is the set of active constraints. So set of active constraints. So I define it as script A of xk, which is the indices, indices i such that ai transpose xk is equal to bi.
let me define the matrix a k equals a i transpose i in a x k and b k as b i i in a x k <coughs> Okay, so I'm stacking the rows of A that are active to get the matrix AK and I'm stacking the elements of B uh, that are active, uh, whose indices are active as a vector BK and I'm going to assume that AK is full rank. AK is full rank, assume. Okay, why is the, why do we need to assume that AK is full rank? So what happens when AK is not full rank? What happens if row 1 and row 2 are just multiples of each other? What does that signify? It means that the null space is not empty. The solutions to the system are not unique. Uh, no, I mean that's that's of course a fact, but it doesn't really help in this case. You would mean that the vectors we have are not linearly independent. Yes, so the vectors we have are not linearly independent, which means that the constraints are not linearly independent, which is a problem when you want to invert certain matrices. Okay, so you want to make sure that all the active constraints are linearly independent. And if in case there is linear dependence between the set of active constraints, then you need to do some amount of pre-processing to remove the constraints that are redundant within this uh, set of active constraints. Okay, so we won't understand how that part is done because there is this whole theory about it. Uh, so we will just assume that AK is full rank at all points of time, okay? Um, if you have redundant constraints, then you have to work a little bit in order to identify what are the redundant constraints and then remove those redundant constraints from your consideration. Okay. So no redundant constraints. Now what's the, yeah? Is the AK a vector or a matrix? It's a matrix. matrix. So, yeah, so I'm going to, so remember that A, this A here, is a matrix A1 transpose, A2 transpose, A M transpose, right? So let's say this one is active, this one is active, and this one is active. So then my AK is just A1 transpose, A2 transpose, and A M transpose, okay? I'm gonna remove all the other rows from the consideration. So it's a matrix, okay? Now, the first thing that we want to understand is what are the feasible descent direction, okay? So, at xk. So, where do I write? Feasible direction. So, let's, instead of doing descent first, just find out what are the feasible direction. So, that is S of xk. What do you guys think should be the feasible direction at this point xk? Okay, so I am at xk. I know that these constraints are active. The other constraints are not active, right? So what are the feasible directions so that I stay along these, along this edge? Yeah, uh, but for small distances, so let's assume that you will not go out of the set. So you want to have D such that 
ए के बी इज इक्वल टू जीरो ओके विच इज द सेम एज ए आई ट्रांसपोज डी इज इक्वल टू जीरो फॉर ऑल आई इन ए एक्स के ओके सो लेट्स लेट्स थिंक अबाउट इट वाई शुड दिस बी द केस सो रिमेंबर एज आई एम मूविंग फ्रॉम दिस पॉइंट एक्स के towards this direction i am maintaining the constraint that this constraint is active and the other constraint is also active but for all other constraints which are this constraint this constraint on this side the bottom constraint all those things are not active and so i can actually move in any direction i want along other constraints but for the constraint number along this surface and the constraint along that surface that has to be active along all such feasible directions in which i can i need to take a step okay so that is simply saying that you have to move orthogonally to the constraints that are is that correct uh if you have to zero then the vectors are orthogonal do i mean orthogonal okay um uh, so the so this is the constraint surface right the vector ai is actually normal to the surface right right so yes you are normal to this ai and you are normal to the other ai okay. uh, along which those are the active constraints at that time at that point okay okay so okay. That, i don't think that we ever stated that so the those constraint vectors those ais are always normal to the surface they define that's always the case yeah so whenever you have AI transpose x plus b. You define a surface like this. So the normal to the surface is AI. Okay, that's the gradient of f, not f. Uh, so my surface is h x equal to zero, and my gradient of h x is AI, and the gradient is always normal to the surface itself. Okay. that's the property of geometry yeah and then do we choose dk such that the argument of of, of the uh del f x k transpose d e uh is minimal we will get to it in a bit yeah but that's that's about right okay there's a little bit more to it okay we will get to it in a bit so if i move along this direction so i pick dk in s of x k and i pick a very small alpha k so i pick alpha k very small then my xk plus 1 which is defined as xk plus alpha k dk would still be in the set x such that ax is less than equal to b okay so why is that So the reason is, I divide it. I divide the matrix A into A K and A minus K, which is which is the. So these are the set of active constraints, and these are the set of non-active constraints, right? And I compute A X K plus one, which is. A X K plus alpha K D K. Okay. A K A minus K X K plus alpha K D K, and this is going to be less than equal to B. Okay, when alpha k is sufficiently small, that's because a k multiplied by x k plus alpha k d k will still be equal to b because of this condition. Okay, and this one is strictly less than b, so if you move a little bit along other directions, then it will still be less than equal to b. So I want to make it formal. So a k x k plus alpha k dk would be b 
will be equals to B k and then A minus k Okay, so we will maintain these two inequalities if we descend along those directions. So a minus k. So a. Remember that I have a k, which are the set of active constraints, and then I'm defining a minus k as the rest of the matrix. Okay, so a minus k equals A3 transpose AM minus 1 transpose. Okay, so those are non-active constraints. Okay, so these are active constraints that are AK and then these are non-active constraints and I'm stacking them together to get A minus K. Okay, so what I'm what I'm saying here is that if you go a little bit along this direction or that direction, these are the two feasible directions, you will maintain, so if, if your dk is in this feasible direction set and if your alpha k is very small, then your xk plus 1 will also be within the set itself, okay? You won't go out of the set. Now, of course, if your alpha k is very large, then you may go out of the set, okay? So if your alpha k is very large, Okay, then you will be here for very large alpha k and then you will be out of the set, you won't be inside the set. Okay, so you have to have alpha k sufficiently small so that you remain within the set and don't go out of the set. Okay, so now any questions so far? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. So wouldn't that second term there just go to zero? Uh, this term? Yeah. Is it more yeah, so this term will be actually equal to zero. Okay. And so that's why you will still be equal to BK. Okay, and this term, of course, will be non-zero, but you don't care because alpha K is sufficiently small. Yes. <laughs> Formalize it so we didn't have to have the <coughs> alpha k very small by saying an x k plus one equals the projection of that argument onto the convex set. Projection? No, I don't want to use projection at this time. But, but that would uh, so remove the alpha k very small constraint. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying it's how we want to do it. I'm saying if we needed to formalize it, we could do that. I have to think about it because I'm not very sure whether projection will solve the problem uh, everywhere. Uh, okay, so let's look at this direction. Okay, I go a little bit along this direction. Uh, I want to come back to this point. I don't want to, so I'm, this is my xk, this is my dk, and this is my xk plus alpha dk. I pick a large value of alpha and then I project it, then I come here. But I don't want to come here, I want to be here, and then I want to decide whether I want to go in this direction or in this direction. So couldn't it be the projection onto the active parts of the convex set? No, then it's making, it, it's becoming more complicated. So active parts of the convex set, so what is active part of the convex set here? I guess you assume it's the one you left from. Yeah, so you have to assume that the one you left from, right? And so there is a more formal way of writing it, which is your alpha must lie in the set xk plus alpha dk multiplied by a should be less than or equal to b. Okay. Okay, howsoever this gets defined, right? Okay, any other question? 
Okay. So now I'm going to erase this part. So what we know that xk plus alpha k dk will lie in ax less than or equal to b set for small values of alpha. Okay. Now, when you are trying to solve this problem, two things can happen. The first thing is case one is s of xk is non-empty and case 2 is s of xk is empty or 0. Okay, so when would this happen? S of xk is non-empty, so going back to this figure, which I'll redraw. So if I'm here, this is my xk. So my S of xk is non-empty, it means that there are at least two directions, d1 and d2, along which I could slide. Case two can happen here, where all three there are three. So this is a three-dimensional space, and three constraints are active at this particular point. Let me call this point x bar, and so my s of x bar is actually just zero, because three constraints are active. They are all linearly independent. So a k is a three cross three matrix, which is invertible. So the only d that satisfies ak multiplied by d equals 0 is d equals 0 itself. Okay, and in which case I don't have any descent direction to go to. I mean, I, there is no feasible direction to go into. So in that particular situation, two things can happen. Either you need to remove one of the active constraints from the constraint set. So let's say you remove this part from the constraint set, in which case you can move along this direction, or you are at the optimal point, you are at the stationary point, and therefore you, your problem is done, your problem is solved. Okay? Yes? So could you formalize that by, by um, removing elements out of the uh, uh, active set until you had a feasible direction you could go into, evaluate it for all of those possible sets, and then select the one that gave you the most minimal f of x when you took the next? Yes, we will formalize it in a bit. Okay, so in this case, either xk is stationary over x, ax less than or equal to b, or remove an active constraint and find another feasible, find a feasible direction. Find a feasible descent direction. Okay, so these are the two cases that could happen within case two. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes. So what's the difference between the empty and zero? Because zero here means that zero vectors, because zero vectors, every, every direction is constant. 
so in this particular point your well what is the difference between empty and zero. zero actually the there will uh, will it ever be empty I don't think so so what happens when you don't have any active constraint in which case your AK is absent and so your D could be anything Rn and what happens when AK is full rank I mean full rank as in AK is invertible in which case D equals 0 is the only so I think S of XK is can only be 0 it may not it can never be empty like completely empty okay so but then 0 is not a direction in which you have to go okay that's a good point so let me Uh, it is that because s of xk cannot be empty it will either be zero or it will be something okay okay so now we need to look at case one where s of xk is non-empty how do i find which one is the descent direction so i'm standing at this point i have these two directions to go to and I need to find which one is the descent direction. So I'm going to solve a problem. So case one, this is too light. So I'm going to solve this problem. I want to minimize gradient of FXK transpose D plus half D transpose HKD such that AKD equal to zero. Does this answer your question? This is how you would find the descent direction. So there's an argument, right? Yeah, so these dk would be the argument. dk star would be the argument of this optimization problem. Now it turns out that this optimization problem can actually be solved exactly and the solution is given by mu k equals minus a k h k inverse a k transpose inverse So this is an intermediate variable and then my dk star is minus hk inverse gradient of fxk plus ak transpose mu k. I'm going to box it. HK is any positive definite matrix. So if your function F is has second derivative, you could potentially take the second derivative of the function. Or you could take it to be identity matrix. And it truly doesn't matter what we pick there. Uh, you know, so uh, let, let's go back to the vanilla gradient descent case. If you take hk to be the second derivative of the function, then it has faster rate of convergence. Mm -hmm. If this is identity or something, then it has slower rate of convergence. Okay. Right. So it does matter, but it 
Okay, so how does it matter? It only matters in the rate of convergence. So it's, it's more of a tunable parameter than yes. something that must be yes. this way or else. Yes, yes. So as long as HK is positive definite, you are fine. So HK must be positive definite. In quasi-Newton method, we took HK to be an approximation of the second derivative <coughs> of the function, right? So it just helps you converge faster uh, but otherwise, as long as it is positive definite, it really doesn't matter um, as far as the descent direction is concerned. Okay, so we start with an optimization problem. We go through a lot of analysis, not analysis, but just figuring out how should we set up the descent direction. And then we come up with another optimization problem. But the good thing with this optimization problem is I can actually solve it by hand. Yes. Um, why do we need that uh, positive definite matrix in the minimization problem to get this to work? Oh, uh, so if I remove this term completely, then what does that do to the choice of D? this is just negative of gradient of F, mm -hmm. right? And you don't quite know whether that would satisfy this constraint or not. Oh, but then you could look for a D which satisfies this constraint and also let, let's go through the proof which says that if SXK is non-empty, then you could pick a D that is a descent direction, okay? And you will see why this being positive definite helps okay. in that situation. Okay. So I want to claim this is too light. Like a red mark. A red? Yeah. Well, anything that contrasts better with white. A black would be preferred, but Let's see, we have some red markers here. This is good. So claim is DK is star, is a feasible descent direction. So if it is non-zero, Okay, so I try to solve this problem and it turns out that dk star is actually a non-zero variable, then a non-zero solution, then it's a feasible descent direction. So how do we prove that? Well, actually, zero is in S of xk. This implies that gradient of fxk transpose dk star plus half dk star transpose hk dk star is less than equal to zero. Okay, why zero? I can plug in d equals zero here to get, so the value of this entire thing will be equal to zero. But now if I evaluate it at dk star, it must be less than equal to zero. Okay, is this point clear to everyone? So why should this be true? So I know that zero is in the feasible solution, is in the feasible set. So AK multiplied by zero equal to zero, so the constraint is satisfied at D equals zero. So I'm going to plug in D equals zero here. So I get zero plus zero, right? But I'm, but DK star is the minimum, so D, so. So it can't be any worse. Yeah, it can't be any worse when you evaluate this objective function at d equals zero. So this is, I want to give it a name. Let me give it a name as g k of d. And so this is g k of zero. Sorry, what set are we optimizing over here? 
the set is AKD equals zero, which is the same as S of S evaluated at XK, right? So these are the feasible sets. So I'm standing here, I have two directions, and I'm trying to optimize this objective function over these two directions. So this implies that gradient of fxk transpose dk star is less than equal to minus half okay which is strictly less than 0 why because hk is positive definite okay and dk star is non zero Okay, yes. So is this just giving us a better descent direction than if it had been an uh, del f xk transpose dk star or as less than zero over or ak d equals zero or is it giving us a different <coughs> descent direction? No, I don't think it is giving you a better descent direction. It is just giving, it is just proving that it is a descent direction. Of course, a better descent direction could be inside the set but we restrict ourselves to going along the edges only until it is absolutely necessary to go inside the set. Okay. 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 So case one is solved. So if SXK is non-empty, if I solve this particular problem and I get a non-zero solution, then it's a feasible descent direction. I pick a small value of alpha K and then I come up with xk plus 1 and redo this entire calculation. Now the problem is that I could encounter a situation where I reach, after taking a few steps, I reach this point. And at that point, three constraints are active in a three-dimensional space. And so my feasible direction set is actually equal to 0. So my dk is equal to 0. So what do we do? So now I'm going to look at the case where dk star is equal to zero. When that happens, then we look at this. Okay, so what happens when dk star is equal to zero? So when dk star is equal to zero, this is a positive definite matrix. It means this term must be zero, right? So if this term is equal to zero, then we need to look at what's happening to mu k. So the first thing that I want to say is that if mu k is greater than or equal to 0, so remember mu k is a vector. So if all elements of this vector is greater than or equal to 0, then it implies that x k is stationary stationary over the set x. Okay, so you have reached a local, opt not local optimal, I shouldn't say local optimal, you have reached a stationary point over the set which is a candidate for locally optimal solution. Yeah. How computationally expensive is the calculation of mu k? Well, as long as all these inverses and matrix multiplication is easy to do. Now, if your A is extremely huge matrix, then this becomes very difficult. So, uh, if, if we have a large AK, we're less likely to wind up using HK equals uh, the uh, second derivative of the function. And because of how large that would be in minute. Well, no. So, I think you are asking what's the computational complexity of computing these matrices, right? The multiplication of these matrices. So you need HK inverse, so if HK is identity, then this is not difficult. But then you still have to, so you still have to find out what are the set of active constraints, so that takes some amount of time. And then you construct the matrix AK, and then you have to take all these inverses, uh, which may or may not be that complicated, I don't know. 
But this is the first known method for solving linear programs, first known efficient method to solve linear programs. So, um, so anyway, so that's, uh, so that's why we are studying it. Uh, so the next, next claim that I'm going to make is if mu k is non-negative, then x k is stationary over the entire set. So I know that dk star equals to zero. This implies that gradient of fxk equals minus ak transpose mu k. I'm going to write it as summation of a a i mu k i i in a x k okay so this is exactly what a k transpose mu k looks like in uh, vector form. Okay, so is this is this point clear? So let's say a k transpose is a1 a r so let me define it as a k equals to a1 transpose a m transpose then a k transpose equals to a1 a m and then a k transpose <coughs> mu is equal to a1 am mu1 mu2 so mu1 mu2 are the two elements of the vector mu and this is the same as mu1 a1 plus mu2 a2 that's what i'm using here to arrive at this particular expression Okay, is this clear to everyone? How do I get, how do I go from here to here? So I have a negative sign here, and then I have a summation over AI, which are the columns of AK transpose, and then I have mu KI, which are the ith element of this vector mu K. Okay, and this I ranges in the set of all active indices of active constraints of this particular point XK. Yes, okay. just a linear combination. Yes. Wasn't that part of the quiz on Wednesday? Which one? Of the summation thing, you multiply like the dot product, like a vector of ones with a, a vector, then you get a summation. One transpose v. Yeah. One transpose v. Yeah, and that, isn't that just basically what you're doing here? No, no, no. So one, tra so one is a vector, v is a vector. So one transpose v is a scalar. That is easy to understand. Here. What I'm doing is multiplying a matrix with a vector, and all I'm doing is writing it as a linear combination of the columns of the matrix. Okay, so it's not similar. Uh, yeah, this is this is slightly different. Okay. Now, what do I need to prove in order to show that x k is stationary over the set? I need to show that gradient of fxk transpose d is greater than or equal to 0 for all d feasible. Okay, and so let's do that. Gradient of fxk transpose d is equal to minus summation mu k i AI transpose D.
that's what I get. Okay, so I am at a point xk so what are the feasible vectors so at the feasible points my ai transpose d should be less than equal to 0 for all i in a xk so those are giving you the vectors that take you inside the set. This is the set of all such feasible directions standing at xk. Okay, so ai transpose d is less than or equal to zero, so you can enter the set. You so you are at the boundary. How do you enter the set? Well, only if ai transpose d is less than or equal to zero for all i in a x k. Okay, so so my feasible. So my feasible directions, in order to get inside the set, satisfies this constraint. And I see that this part is non-negative for all possible feasible d. So this part is negative. There is a negative sign. This part is positive by the assumption mu k greater than or equal to 0. So this is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Okay, so there are a lot of things that we are using here. Yes. What does mu k signify? Oh, what does mu k signify? So once we study k k d conditions, mu k would be the Lagrange multipliers corresponding to this equality constraint. But since we haven't yet studied k k d conditions, currently mu k is just a variable. Okay, but after four or five classes, it has it'll have a special name called Lagrange multiplier. Okay. So we have tackled two case, which is if dk is if dk star is non-zero, I can I can show that this is a descent direction. If dk star turns out to be zero but mu k is all positive, then I can show that xk is stationary over the set x. Okay, and therefore you are at a first order, you are at you are at a point that satisfies the first order necessary condition, and then of course if it satisfies a sufficient condition, then you have a guarantee of optimality. Now, what happens if you have one, at least one element of mu k that is negative? Okay. Then it turns out that in that case, here is what you need to do. Uh, So case dk star equals to 0, mu k j bar is less than 0. So there is at least one element of this vector mu k that is strictly negative. Okay. Then in this case, remove j bar from the set of active constraints. Okay, so you get a bar of xk, which is a of xk minus j bar. And then you find d bar k star, which is argmen of over d plus such that a k bar d equals to 0. j in a bar x k. Yeah. 
Yes. If you have have multiple elements of mu k that are less than zero, is it safe to remove more than one at once, or do we have to go through and iterate this and pull one off at a time? It just pull one off at a time. Okay. Yeah. So remember, you are at this point. You have. So, and you are coming from this direction, right? So you don't want to go back in that direction. Now you have only two feasible p options to go in this direction or in this direction. So if you remove one of the J bar, you will get one of the directions in which you need to go to. If you remove two J bars that are negative, you might be going along these directions, which is not an edge. Where is the guarantee that we won't be moving back in the same direction we came from at this point coming from? Oh, because you're always descending. You're always picking a descent direction, okay. right? So you can't be going in the ascent direction because it's guaranteed to be a descent direction. Which the argument of the yeah, case. yeah. So now what can be shown is that dk star is a descent direction, and dk star is not equal to 0. Okay, this has a little bit, uh, it has a little complicated proof, but it can be shown that if you remove this J bar from the set of active constraints and proceed with this algorithm, you will get a non-zero value of D, D bar K star. You will get a non-zero value of D bar K star and it will be a guaranteed descent direction. Okay, yes. Uh, just to back up a little bit, why are we saying that the allowed set of directions uh, could be could be such that a sub i transpose d is zero? Doesn't that mean that we would still just be moving along an edge, or is that are we just making the point that we're always allowed to move along an edge, but we also want to consider going in? In so when you are looking for the first order necessary condition, you want to be able to go in as well. No matter which direction you go to, you are always going to increase the value of your function. So I, I, okay, so I guess the question I should have asked is, why are we considering the equal to zero case there? Why don't we just restrict ourselves? This is to less that? than equal to zero. I understand. Oh, yeah. So why why is that? Why don't we just consider those that get send us into the space? So those that are strictly less than zero. Right? Okay. If, if we if we allow D to be such that that is still zero, then we are still going to be moving orthogonal, right? Right. To the yes. So let's say let's let me draw this whole point again. So you are standing. So I'm looking at it, looking at it from this point of view. So I am standing here. If I want to find a direction to go to find a descent direction, I am restricted to go only along these two directions. But if I want to prove optimality, I'm allowed to go in this direction, this direction, inside the set, of course, along these two directions as well. Okay. So now these two directions are given by these two directions are given by AI transpose D equal to zero for all I in active constraints at XK. But what about these directions? How do you get these directions? Well, these directions are given by AI transpose D is less than equal to zero for all i in a x k. Well, wouldn't those just be the directions that are less than zero then? And it's well, the equal to that gets us along the edge? Uh, no. So, no. So the thing is, let's say, a, so in this case, the a x k has two points, yeah. right? This side and that side. Mm -hmm. So you could have one equal to zero, but the other one strictly negative, in which case you're sliding along one of the planes. In the other case, vice versa, so you're sliding along the other planes and then yeah, strictly negative is you're just going inside the set. You're not going sliding along the planes. Okay, okay so it basically covers all possible, all possible directions uh, when you're standing at xk. Okay, so this is the famous simplex method for optimization. Uh, I mean, simplex method in the context of linear programming. This was proposed back in 1940, somewhere in 1940s. 47, okay, by Danzig. He was an American mathematician, an operations research person. Okay, so he came up with this algorithm uh, 
For linear programming, then of course it was extended to nonlinear programs, and this is known as manifold suboptimization method if you have an arbitrary nonlinear function over linear constraints. So how do you solve it? First of all, you come up with an optimization formulation. You have to find out the active constraints, then you have to come up with an optimization formulation, then you have to find mu k star and dk star. If dk star is non-zero, take a step in that direction. If dk star turns out to be equal to zero, then you have to check whether mu k is non-negative. If it is non-negative, you are at a stationary point. There is nothing much you need to do now. And if mu k star has a negative element, then drop that from the set of active constraints and then proceed with the formulation and you're guaranteed to descend again. So that's all I needed to say. If you have any questions, you can talk to me after the class. Thank you.